Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. Today's episode is amazing. Dr. Lindsay Gibson is the guest, and if you've been a longtime listener, she was on episode 43 where she talks about adult children of emotionally immature parents. It was an amazing episode. It's one of the most downloaded episodes, and I asked if she would come back and talk about relationships. If you are new to the podcast, you might also want to listen to episode 85 with Amy Marlowe McCoy on narcissism. There's some crossover in these and it'll give you a really good foundation of what an emotionally immature parent is. And we do talk about it at the beginning of this episode. But in this episode, some of the things that we talk about are Dr. Gibson defines what is emotional immaturity. We talk about, is there a thing as a healthy relationship? Does it make sense to categorize relationships as healthy and unhealthy? How would you describe a healthy relationship? What should be deal breakers in any close relationship? How do you assess if your relationship is healthy or not? What would you look for if you were doing online dating to help identify the person's level of emotional maturity? Why is it hard to end a difficult relationship? What are some of the personality characteristics of a person who's capable of a healthy relationship? Why are some people very aware of their unhappy childhoods yet find themselves involved with difficult people in their adult relationships? What signs should a person look for at the beginning of a relationship in order to assess its potential for becoming a healthy relationship? And what are the biggest red flags that you might be getting involved with an emotionally immature person? I love this episode. I think you're going to just really appreciate it. A couple of things. The recording actually dumped out while we were towards the end. I'm a little unhappy about it. So I'm just giving you a heads up that uh, Lindsay's talking and all of a sudden she's gone. A couple of seconds later, I come back on and I tell you, hey, this just dumped out. So this is what we were talking about. And then we pick it up. So I just wanted to let you know. The other thing that Lindsay and I talked about after we hung up is we're talking about really the ideal, what you would want in a healthy relationship. And Lindsay's been married over 40 years. I've been married 23 years. Relationships go through seasons, people. If you think that a relationship is going to be thriving and involved and engaging 100% of the time, that's just not how it is. And especially during COVID, many people are under stress. Relationships are under stress. Part of what makes a relationship healthy is the commitment to stick it through when things get boring, tired, we're under stress, we're at our worst. I'm not talking about things that are abusive or that are not healthy, but longevity in relationships is really about the commitment to stay in the relationship through the different seasons of a relationship. If you're interested in getting the top 10 most downloaded episodes, and Lindsay's episode is one of those, you can Look in the show notes, there's a link, or you can go to my website and on the header, it says there's a link that you can click to get these episodes. So 23 months into podcasting, my very first episode, I talk about having a mailing list. (laughs) Remember my motto, done is better than perfect. So at the 23 month mark, uh, thank you to Melissa Childs Hugs, who helps me function really, really well. We finally got the mailing list, list together. So if you do sign up for the top most downloaded episodes. You also will be signed up for the mailing list. You can unsubscribe if you don't want to. My plan is to send out some regular mailings, but you know, could be a while. Let me tell you about Dr. Gibson. Lindsay Gibson, PsyD, has been a licensed clinical psychologist for over 30 years and specializes in individual adult psychotherapy with adult children of emotionally immature parents. She is the author of three books, Her most recent book, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, remains a number one Amazon bestseller. The follow-up to this book is Recovering from Emotionally Immature Parents, and the second edition of her first book, Who You Were Meant to Be, has just been released on Amazon. In the past, 
Dr. Gibson has served as an adjunct assistant professor teaching doctoral psychology students, and she writes a monthly well-being column for Tidewater Women Magazine in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I think you're going to love this. And now, on to the show. Hey, Lindsay, welcome. Hi, it's great to be back, Patricia. I am so excited to have you back. Before we started recording, your episode is one of the most downloaded episodes that I've done. I'm in a bunch of Facebook groups, and anytime somebody talks about adult children of immature parents, your name comes up and people love you. Do you, do mm-hmm. you have a sense of that? I, I really do, because I've been so fortunate that so many readers have uh, contacted me, sent me letters, uh, sent me emails, responded to my website. <laughs> I mean, it's it's amazing the response that I've gotten and such warmth from people who really have been very grateful to be exposed to these ideas and, and this psychoeducation about these um, emotionally immature people. Yeah, so it's been great. It's so powerful when somebody names something that you've experienced that you haven't been able to identify. It's so validating because it can feel crazy making because... Yeah, it's just very powerful. So you are changing lives. I'm very clear about that. Oh, well, thank you. That's, that's, that's my hope. That's my, my dream. You're doing it. Why don't we start out for people that are new to listening? Can you define what emotional immaturity is? Sure. People can uh, grow up physically and intellectually, mentally, in ways that are completely adult. And yet at an emotional level, they really respond to the world much more like young children. But a lot of the people that I came to to know about were the parents of my clients who were coming in Uh, My clients were coming in because they were suffering from anxiety, depression, relationship problems. And as they were talking and talking about the people in their lives, I'm sitting there as a therapist thinking, why is this person in my office? Because (laughs) I could tell that people around them were much less together, much less mature than the person who would come to see me for psychotherapy. So as I listened, uh, my psychologist diagnostician hat came on and I realized that they were talking about developmental characteristics that were much more common in a three, four, five-year-old than you would think they would be in a you know 55-year-old parent, for example. As a quick way of understanding emotional immaturity, just think of what a three-year-old is like. They're not very complex. They're pretty simplistic. Whatever's on the surface is is what they're dealing with. They don't go beneath the surface or think about things in any depth. They have very poor empathy. Uh, They really cannot emotionally imagine another person's experience. So what happens is that they respond and react without a thought for what the other person might be feeling or thinking. They tend to be very black and white, very judgmental. You're good. You're bad. You do what I want. I love you. You don't do what I want. I hate you. (laughs) it's, uh, It's the way little kids are. And we don't hold that against little kids because we understand that they're actually, you know, pretty simplistic, frail little beings And we have to cut them some slack because they're going to be growing into complexity and empathy and the ability to think and feel at the same time and to consider other people's rights and feelings, which is something that three-year-olds have a lot of trouble with. And would that also be with that black and white thinking that if you give them feedback about their behavior or setting a boundary, then they too would go into, you love me, you hate me, I do everything for you, you don't appreciate me, those extremes as well? Absolutely. Yep. Because one of the things that a three-year-old lacks and what an uh, emotionally immature person lacks is they lack the ability to be self-reflective. They can't stand outside themselves and reflect back with any kind of perspective on their own behavior or their own experience. 
they are their experience. They're not thinking about their experience. So it makes it very hard for them to take responsibility and accountability for their effect on other people because that is not at all what they're paying attention to. They're just reacting to what's happening in the immediate moment. Would that be like self-referential? Everything is really in yeah. relationship to themselves the way that a very young child would be. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's all about me. It's me, me, yeah. me. Mm-hmm. Where does attachment or does attachment have a place in this as well? Or are we getting out of bounds? Because we didn't talk about, we were going to talk about this. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's fine because attachment is a big topic. But what I suspect, I don't have, I didn't do um, clinical research on this, but what I suspect from their characteristics is that these emotionally immature people had something that happened early in their life that undermined their secure attachment. And having a secure attachment to a parent figure is essential in order to develop the self. And in order to be self-reflective, in order to think about how you affect other people, you have to be able to have that sense of self. They go empathy and sense of self go hand in hand. So what happens is that we develop our sense of self through an empathic connection with a parent who wants us, who's interested in us, and who can imagine what our internal experience is like. When we get that, it's it's like a, a reciprocal loop. It, it goes in, we get a sense of ourselves from the feeling of that connection with the other person. That's the attachment. If something goes wrong there, my sense of self gets messed up. It it, it feels insecure. It doesn't feel whole. I am now preoccupied with getting my immediate emotional needs met, not working on developing my sense of self. It becomes an emergency as opposed to a relationship in which I can calm down and grow at my own speed. Right. And what I'm thinking of is early on for me, because I had attachment injuries that I would be in crisis and I'd reach out to someone because I needed them to help co-regulate me. And if they weren't available, it would send me into a tizzy. Not only were they not there for me, but it felt like my survival depended on it because I didn't know how to manage my emotions. And so I think we have this tendency to try and, you know, I've talked about my mom and I have a great relationship now, but she was an overwhelmed, single, anxious parent. I didn't learn how to to manage my own emotions. And so I picked relationships where people would help me do that, trying to work that out. But I would want them to reparent me because I didn't learn how to do that. And so if they weren't available, I'd either get angry or I'd go into panic because I didn't know how to manage and I I was looking for someone outside of myself. Is this something common that you see? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, boy, you're not alone in that, Patricia. When you don't get that co-regulation from the parent, there's a very particular kind of wound that causes, there's a a book, it's really a sort of a textbook for therapists, but I, I found it fascinating recreational reading too. It's called The Primal Wound by Furman and Gilla. The primal wound is when the parent doesn't respond to the emotional state of the child with empathy. And the child actually experiences something that is worse than death, than a fear of death, physical death. It is a it is a sensation of dropping away from the world. It's a, an annihilation experience, like being untethered in outer space, okay? And people will do anything to avoid having that experience. And a lot of behavior that can look like it's manipulative or acting out or whatever is actually an attempt to bring somebody in to connect in some way, you know, (laughs) even if it's in in a uh, disciplinary way or uh, a way that looks unpleasant. But man, that is so much better than drifting away in outer space. So it's it's a crucial experience that 
people will do anything to avoid. My guess too is that for people that are highly sensitive, deep thinkers, deep feelers, because we're so in tune with the environment that we probably learn how to show up and be present for our parents and meet their needs in what could be called codependency or just really tuning in with our parents to have that sense of connection, but not ever really knowing what it is that we're wanting or needing because that's what our, what we need for survival is, is that an accurate statement? Yeah, absolutely. And the other part of that is that we come to know what we need. We come to know our emotional experiences through the interaction with the parent who responds to us. If the parent is not responding or the parent is preoccupied or distracted and you're not getting that feedback, you won't learn that this sensation physically is called loss or anger or anxiety. You you won't have any names for these inner states because the parent isn't saying, oh, honey, that really scared you. Or, wow, you look like you're really mad about something. Did something get under your skin? And look at all the vocabulary <laughs> that child's being given for naming and understanding that there are these things that go on inside me and I can put names on them. And then if I can put names on them, I can sort of manipulate them and think about them. They, they become mine. But if you don't get that from the parent, you're kind of awash in these feelings that can feel very overwhelming and scary. Right. What I find with the people that come to work with me, and, and I think, again, as HSPs, we're really good at figuring out what the rules are, what society expects from us, how to fit in and meld ourselves into what every everything in the environment around us needs. But we don't always know what we're thinking and feeling and being able to assert that, which leads really well into our discussion about relationships that I can say my first marriage was about like, I just found someone who loved me because I felt so unlovable. I, there was no way that I could think about what do I need? What do I want? What are the deal breakers? And I see this frequently with people who get into relationships and we don't think about what is really important. What do I bring to a relationship? What do I need in a relationship? What are red flags? Because we're so starved for having someone who just sees us or shows us some amount of love that we kind of lose all that other stuff, which is why I really wanted to have this discussion with you today, because I, I just think it's a really important one. Is there anything that you wanted to say before I move on to my next question? No, no, no. Go ahead. So is there such a thing as a healthy relationship? Does it make sense to categorize relationships as healthy and unhealthy? Yes. <laughs> there is such a thing. <laughs> Do tell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I always, you know, whenever I hear the word health, for some reason, I don't know why this is, but I think of plants, you know, because plants are so simple and they're so transparent and, you know, their needs are so obvious. If you don't water them, they droop. <laughs> you feed them in two days, they're greener. I mean, they're, they're, they're just such a, a great example of, of health and unhealth. So I think of that model when I think about, um, you know, is it, correct to talk about relationships as healthy, because I think that healthy relationships are growing relationships. Sometimes growing is not necessarily getting bigger so much as it is that the organism or the relationship is really good at repairing and replenishing whatever it is that goes on in the process of living. So there's, you know, there's feeding, there's tending, there's supporting that's going on. And if that's happening, you know what your plants look like. Um, they, they look sturdy, they, they're upright, they, they have a glow, they, they look healthy. And that's what it takes for relationships as well. When they're unhealthy, it's kind of like one or both partner is becoming stagnant. Life is funny about the way that it moves forward. It's always seeming to be going for the next best thing. And sometimes when you're getting into a stagnant state, you're just one step away from succumbing to a stressor or something that is going to deteriorate your health. So it's not okay just to stop and be stagnant because then you're really at risk 
for some stressor coming in and affecting the whole system negatively. Uh, we want to be growing or replenishing in such a way that the life force is strong. And so that that's how I think about relationships in terms of being healthy. Yeah, I was reflecting on your plant analogy. And while ideally we want our plants to be healthy and strong, it's really about when they get too much sun or not enough water or something happens that we have the ability to go in and tend to those plants to do what we can to bring them back to health. And I think it's the same thing with relationships that it's really about the ability to go in and do repair work and to do the hard work. Can can the relationship tolerate that? That's where the health comes from. But I, I'd love to know, how would you briefly describe a healthy relationship? A relationship that's healthy, in a nutshell, it's it, it supports and builds the energy and the individuality of each partner. So building the energy, building the individuality of each partner. There is empathy and interest. When I say empathy, I don't mean just that you sort of feel, you know, sad when the other person looks sad, that kind of mirroring empathy. That's one kind of empathy. But there's another kind of empathy called mentalizing. And it's what a good parent does with their baby. And what mentalizing is, is that I actually imagine what your internal experience is like. I mean, a non-fancy way of describing it is I put myself in your shoes and the baby, you know, can't talk, can't express itself. All I can do is cry. But if I am a sensitive and attached parent, then I can imagine how that baby feels through my imaginative ability, and also through my heart empathy. So that's uh, incredibly important because when partners can mentalize each other's experience and be interested in that, it really helps the relationship to be one where growth and replenishment is going on all the time. And finally, I would say that a healthy relationship is mutually supportive. Each partner is interested in the welfare of the other, enjoys the support, enjoys the success of the other, and that they're willing to learn from each other. That is something that I think is so, so important and also so enjoyable about a really good relationship because it keeps it so interesting that you can continue to uh, learn about the other person and they bring things into your life that otherwise you wouldn't have. So your energy stays really good. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the personality characteristics of a person who's capable of a healthy relationship? Well, here's where the highly sensitive person has an advantage because one of the most important um, attributes of someone who is capable of a healthy relationship is that they are sensitive enough to perceive and register the other person's experience. So, you know, just what you were just talking about with the the child who tunes into what the parent needs, but oh my goodness, what an asset that is in a loving relationship as an adult to be able to do that kind of uh, alignment and tune in. They also have to have a complex enough personality. This is not your simplistic black and white, good, bad, emotionally immature personality. They have to be complex enough to be able to recognize and support another person's individuality, Uh, to be able, like I said before, to imagine a person's needs and to remember their preferences. That is so important. It seems like a small thing, but boy, it's amazing how many problems that causes in a, in a close relationship when the other person is not remembering or not interested in remembering someone's preferences. So they have to have like a, a big enough, complex enough personality structure to be able to take the other person into account automatically. Now, this is not when they're trying to take the other person into account. I'm talking about automatic empathy, 
automatic empathy is when I don't have to think about it. I feel it. You know, if, if my partner is upset, I don't have to think, oh, they're looking upset. That's right. Remember, he got mad at me last time. I didn't ask. I'm going to ask this time. How are you doing, honey? Okay. That's walking through the steps. That would be me stretching to be empathic. But if I have automatic empathy, I see it. I feel it. I've said, how are you, honey? Before I even know what, what happened. (laughs) So people can stretch and appear to be empathic in quotes when they really are having to work at it. And that's not really the measure of a person who's, who's capable of a healthy relationship. It's a person who's trying to uh, work with them. Uh, the other thing that I, I like to um, be aware of is that they're able to take turns. They can uh, problem solve. They want you to be happy with the result if you're doing some kind of working at some kind of compromise. It isn't just that they're looking at what they can get. They actually want you to be happy with the result as well. It's not a win for them if they've gotten something at your expense because that automatic empathy, they feel it when you're not happy. And then, of course, if they're creative and resilient, that's a bonus. (laughs) But basically, it's that complexity and that ability to feel for the other person. Mm -hmm. What about the ability to be vulnerable and to manage conflict or tolerate conflict or uncomfortable feelings? Oh, thank you. That is huge. Thank you for reminding me of that. It's tremendous. Because if you can be vulnerable, your partner will sense that and it tends to move you very quickly into a place where you really can address and solve the problem. Because when both parties are able to be vulnerable, you very quickly get to what the real matter is and that can be solved. If you're being defensive and protecting yourself and hiding the pain, that's where you get into all kinds of problems and things get tangled up. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that those things that you mentioned are incredibly important. Yeah. It's interesting because I've got wounding because I have attachment injuries. I've been married for 23 years. I've been with my husband longer than that. He really does a beautiful job of holding space for me. And we were walking the dogs the other day and I'm wanting to get a kayak. And I was telling him, I just realized that it's the thing that just lights me on fire to be in the water. And I was feeling discouraged because I was looking and they were really expensive. And he said, oh, so on the entire walk, I could see myself. I just watched myself decompensate. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't know how important this is. He just wants me to sit in my disappointment. I mean, I just went to this really very dark place and I just knew better to keep my mouth shut. So by the time we were just about home, I was able to say like, Hey, this isn't your responsibility, but I kind of had this reaction. And here's what I would have liked from you, you know, to really help me in my frustration and disappointment. Because I'm telling you, like I figured, especially during COVID, (laughs) I found something that brings me joy. And he just had no idea. And he's always very quick to want to get on board and, you know, support me and whatever it is. And I have to tell you, since then, every morning, it's like, where are we at with a kayak? What do we need to do today? Like he understands, but it's, as we talk about these traits of what it looks like in a healthy relationship, you know, I watch myself circle the drain in five seconds. I mean, I just circled the drain to an incredibly disempowered place. So while, while we're talking about what these qualities are, I think many of us have wounding that we bring to our relationships and there are ways that we can still have healthy relationships in spite of, you know, how I just decompensated so quickly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, you you bring up something, Patricia, that I was just writing about this morning because, yeah, I was thinking about, well, what is the goal of psychotherapy? Like, is the goal of psychotherapy that you would never circle the drain, that you would never have that reaction based on your history, that you would always sort of hit the ground running and never f- start the fantasies about him not loving you or whatever? No, (laughs) no, because our histories, I carry my history around, you carry your history around. Our histories are there. It's like Russian nesting dolls. They're in there, okay? But we 
enlarge our cells through psychotherapy. So now we have room for our history, but we also have this bigger and bigger doll, so to speak, that we're inhabiting that has room for us to understand where we come from and for us to have empathy and compassion for those little children in us. And then we can work with it and come up with this beautiful approach that you had with your husband where you said, you know, this is not yours to fix, but let me, let me share with you what my inner experience was. And then he has a chance because you were vulnerable. He has a chance to give you what you want, what you need, which he proceeded to do, because I'm sure that's enjoyable for him. (laughs) I just, that's a sidebar, but I, I just had to bring that up because to me, that is a more beautiful tapestry than if, somehow we changed your mind so that you never had such a thought ever again. To me, that's kind of uninteresting Mm -hmm. and simplistic, but I love the fact that you can have a reaction and then progress your way out of it. Yeah. Well, and it was interesting because in the morning he was, when I told him about it, about wanting the kayak, he was really supportive. And this was when we walked the dogs in the evening. And after we talked about this, he said like, I told you this morning I supported you, which reminded me of, you know, when, when a couple gets married and the wife says, well, I'm, I'm going to backtrack. I don't want to gender that. When one partner says, do you love me? And the other partner says, like, I married you. Of course I love you. And so in my husband's mind that morning, he was supportive. And in the evening, because I feel things deeply, I was discouraged and disappointed. So whatever he did in the morning was like, that was over. And again, I think as deeply feeling people, this often goes on for us. And from his perspective, he told me once, like, he supports me. So I think that these are where we can really get into, we process things differently. So what you're talking about is that ability to, to see the perspective from somebody else, even though that wasn't where he was coming from. And then, you know, he's just a great guy able to, to respond in a way that is just incredibly healing and reparative for me. Exactly. Because even though what you're describing, uh, is that your, your husband for him, it makes sense that having told you that you would carry that inside no matter what, at least for the rest of the day, you know, if not for, if not for the rest of your life. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, that would, that would be counterintuitive to think otherwise. But when you explain to him your experience, he mentalizes you and he's right there. He understands what you're saying. It's not how he works, but it's how you work and he right. loves you. And so that's the healthy person part of it. He enjoys being able to do that back and forth with you around something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's lovely. Thank you. I'm lucky to have him. He's my little anchor. He's my big anchor. Why are some people very aware of their unhappy childhoods yet find themselves involved with difficult people in their adult relationships? Yeah, this is this is really a big thing in psychotherapy with adult children of emotionally immature parents because their insight is so good. I mean, they're very sensitive, very perceptive. A lot of these people, they have very vivid memories a lot of times. They can remember things that happened. It's it's not a mystery why they feel the way they do because they're very tuned in and and able to process their experiences, it appears that they have really good insight into what's causing them to feel the way that they do. And therefore, you would think with all that insight and all those memories, they would steer clear of people who treated them badly or people who weren't going to meet their needs. That, That would be logical to expect. But what happens is that their coping mechanisms are so mature and so good. You know, they, they can compartmentalize, they can suppress feelings, they can use humor to, to lighten things up. Uh, they use altruism, they help other people. Let's see, what was another one? They, they're just able to function at a very high level a lot of the time. And so you would expect that they would be able to, you know, remember their experiences in childhood and not repeat them. But what happens is their excellent coping mechanisms allow them to shut down 
the emotional memories, which is the painful part of what happened to them in childhood. So they shut that down, push it away. That that is an ego strength. (laughs) That is a high order ability where you're not awash in your emotions all the time. You're able to compartmentalize it, push it down, not deal with the emotion. You can remember what happened, but you're not overwhelmed by the emotion. But that's not a good thing when you're trying to change. Because in order to change, you have to have the emotional realization of what happened to you. When that truth can come back in and you experience what it was like being with someone who didn't treat you like a full human being as a child, once you experience that, yeah, you will not fail to notice it in your adult life. But so often these very high functioning people with their great defenses just don't have the emotional experience to warn them. And another way of saying that they don't have the gut feeling. They don't get the instinct like, oh, that that didn't feel good or wow, that was pushy or gee, he just talked right over me like I wasn't even here. No, they tend to not even feel it and focus on other things with their uh, intellectual mind. And you can get really, really misled that way. I want to clarify, because what I sometimes see is people can verbalize what happened, and it's very intellectual, but it's not connected on a feeling level. Mm -hmm. So there are two things that I'm hearing you saying is one, not connecting with the memory. Is it also possible to connect intellectually, but to not do the feeling work? And so I can say, I know that my mom was, this isn't true for me. So mom, not talking about you. You know, my mom was an alcoholic and she beat me and blah, blah, blah. And that's why I keep picking men. But if I don't do the emotional work, I'm not going to have that connection. Is that what I hear you saying? Yes, that that is exactly what I'm saying, in fact, because, um, yeah, what I meant to stress is that they often do have the memories. They, They can tell you this is how my mother acted. This is what she did. They absolutely have the memories. And that's what's misleading to the therapist because the therapist thinks they've got it. They, they know what happened to them. <laughs> We've arrived. <laughs> but they don't get any better. They don't feel less depressed, less anxious. The, the symptoms are still there. And that is because just like you're saying, the feeling part has been separated out from the memory. And you have to do therapeutic techniques that help you go back in and have uh, an experiential working through of the emotion and, and also the sort of the hidden emotional beliefs that are in there. Yeah. So um, absolutely. You're exactly right. The, the other thing I was going to say is that it's so foundational to emotionally immature people that they make other people think that they are not as important as the emotionally immature person. It's just the way they do life. It's the way that three-year-olds do life. I'm sorry, your needs are just not as important as mine. <laughs> and that is a, that's a very deep part of people's self-image to get that message early on that, you know, we love you. It's nice to have you, but honey, you're just not as important as me. What's going on with you has to take a back seat because we're the grown-ups and we're the really important ones here. That's the message from the EI parent. Yeah. And how I see this being played out is many of us turn into being helpers or healers, nurses, therapists, teachers, acupuncturists, massage therapists, that way that we want to use the healing that we have. And we become often can become caregivers and have a really hard time giving to ourselves and putting our own needs and priorities first, because we get that sense of kind of connection and efficacy when we can be there for other people. But putting our own wants and needs first can really be challenging because we just didn't get that. And so going into a helping field can be a way to quasi get that connection. But it's really not about me and my needs and asking people to be there and show up for me, which can be really challenging. And and it's elusive because it looks like there's connection there, but it's really about me connecting over your needs, not asking for you to show up for me. Yeah, exactly. And of course, doing it that way, you don't have to ever be vulnerable. Yeah. So that's, 
Yeah, you can just identify with the other person getting that need met. And that's very satisfying. But it, it it's not the cure. <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And I was also thinking while you were talking, so for those people that are in therapy, and you're in that place where it just feels like you're in the dark, because you're experiencing this heaviness right now, that's healing. And it often, you know, there are those, those memes of the parrot that, you know, is well put together. And then it says after therapy, and it's all the, the feathers are all flustered and stuff like sometimes that would happen. That's what happens after therapy. And sometimes it's the opposite way. But for people that are really doing deep work, sometimes it feels like things get worse before they get better, because we are going back and doing that deep healing. And we're seeing how much this shows up for us in so many aspects. It's like, there's a hole that we fall into, and then we see the hole and we jump in the hole. Like that's sometimes the messy part of therapy. So if you're experiencing that with your therapist right now, it could be that you're doing some pretty powerful healing. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Is there anything else around this that we want to talk about before we move on? About that particular question? Yeah. Well, you know what I'm wondering? I mean, I also think that we tend to pick people to try and work through past relationships Mm -hmm. that, you know, if I had a mom that was withholding, I somehow somehow seem to pick women friends that are withholding or the opposite of the nurturing, trying to heal that like this. I, I think that psychologically, it's like the compulsion to repeat, which to me is trying to work things out that really aren't about the current relationship. Is that a factor that plays into this also? That's the way I look at it, too. I, I'm very, there's a therapist in uh, California, um, Bruce Ecker, who talks about a pro-symptom approach. And what that means is that he looks at whatever the symptoms or problems are as being for a good purpose. That is what you're describing, where you are trying to that this person is is in your life so that you can learn w- what happened to you process it get past it yeah i i think that our our problematic relationships are always bringing us you know the last remnants of what it is that we need to be healed from i very much believe that yeah. I always like putting it in a positive, like we're just trying to figure stuff out. It's not that there's something bad about it. We're just trying to work stuff out. Mm-hmm. What signs should a person look for at the beginning of a relationship in order to assess its potential for becoming a healthy relationship? And if you're hearing Lindsay's looking through her notes right now, that is the sound of paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, these I actually had to write down because uh, there, there are quite a few of them. But uh, being the other person being realistic and reliable, that's foundational because if the person is not being realistic, I, I, I don't know what else can't follow from that, but it's a lot. And that they work with reality. They, they don't fight with reality. They work with reality. They, they try to understand what's really going on not jump to conclusions and judge quickly uh, so that they can be reactive. So they can think and feel at the same time. Um, You can reason with them, even if they're upset. Um, And conversely, when you're talking about something at an intellectual level, they don't lose access to their feeling part either. They can be empathetic. We've talked about that before. Respectful of your boundaries. That is huge. If you want to get to know somebody really quickly, set some kind of boundary with them and you watch how they respond. If they are a healthy relationship candidate, they will immediately grant you that boundary. And they might even be curious or interested in why you have that boundary. But it starts with their acknowledgement that you have the perfect right to say no to anything. And they are granting that as your individuality that they're going to respect. They don't psychoanalyze you. Uh, They don't try to talk you out of your feelings or tell you what you're feeling or tell you what you should be feeling. (laughs) That's a classic move in a cult, by the way, where they tell you in order to be a good person, you have to think and feel certain ways 
and they talk you out of your gut feelings um, in an attempt to keep control over you. So people who don't do that are who you're looking for. They can wait and they're patient. Emotionally immature people are incredibly impatient. They don't handle stress well. So if you see flashes of irritability or impatience in somebody fairly early in the relationship, I would look out big time. It seems like a small thing, but it won't be small later. Especially in the beginning, you know, it's it's our representative is who shows up. It takes six months to a year to really get to know somebody. So you would kind of hope that somebody's going to be on their best, better behavior when you first get to know someone. And if they can't even manage it when they're supposed to be putting on a little bit of an act, danger. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, on the first day of school, they're they're uh, acting up. Yeah, exactly. Another thing I like uh, about emotionally healthy people is that they have the capacity to receive. Emotionally immature people have a low receptive capacity. That's because they're so defensive and often suspicious of other people. But an ability to receive is such a pleasure to be in relationship with because you get to have the feeling often that you've done enough, that you've satisfied them. That is a rare experience with an emotionally immature person. They're always sort of, you know, looking at what you gave them, you know, with sort of like, well, did I don't think they did this quite right. <laughs> but an emotionally mature person, yes, they can absolutely be given to. And then of course, if they're enjoyable and playful, as well. I think that's hugely important, along with the sense of humor, because it means that they are uh, even tempered and they can sort of ride the uh, the wave of what's happening and not get pulled into these intense emotional reactions that are so difficult to live with. And finally, I would say that you know, their ability to apologize, make amends, and their ability to make you feel seen and understood, like they get you. You can see it in their eyes that they get you. That's what I would be looking for if I was seeking a healthy relationship. And I would expand on the ability to apologize to own their behavior. Yes. I'm really sorry I was late. I'm really sorry to hear that that hurt your feelings. That must have been awful. Mm-hmm. As opposed to, well, you're just too sensitive. You can't take a joke. I didn't mean it that way. Oh my I was I was working late. Of course, you expect me to be home all the time. And there was traffic you don't ever understand instead of, gosh, I get that you cook tonight and I was late and you were expecting me. That must be really disappointing. Yes. And when somebody returns to their intention instead of your hurt or your feelings, that does not feel good. Um, And we all do it. We, you know, we say, uh, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't intend that. That wasn't what I was thinking. But hopefully we move off of that to give the other person recognition of how they're feeling, because that's incredibly important to do. Just like you were, you're saying you need to feel validated. So when people sort of say that they shouldn't be guilty because they didn't intend it, uh, there's really something missing in the empathy department there. Yeah. Yeah. If you like Brene Brown's podcast, Unlocking Us, she does a two-part episode with Harriet Lerner on apologies and forgiveness. It's a, it's really powerful. I, I really learned a lot from that. Mm. And I think you just want to say about all of these things are, these are the ideals and you want to have these. And I can tell you after being with my husband for so many years, we still squabble, we still fight during COVID things happen. And then I have to go back in and say, gosh, I, I realize I'm feeling really powerless about what's happening in the world today, but I can raise my voice at you because I'm feeling really powerless. So it's not that you're going to be able to do all of these things all the time that, and as we're doing our healing, we can go, I'm really struggling with this right now. Like I, in my house, like I'm a blamer. Everybody knows I'm a blamer. My son's a blamer. So, you know, where did you put this? It's like, here it is. Oh, I'm the blamer. You know, so that's being able to take humor and know that like, that's what I do. I just blame in the sense of like, you move my stuff, you touch my stuff because that's a hot spot for me. So it's not about doing it perfectly. It's about being able to name what goes on and how we process through things. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest red flags that you might be getting involved with an emotionally immature person? There are two that I really like because they're so subtle. (laughs) One is that you feel like you can't be completely yourself with them. Now, if you really like the person, you know, maybe they seem like a good candidate, maybe they're really good looking, um, you know, whatever, they might check a lot of boxes. You're probably not going to quibble over that feeling like I, I, I'm not completely being myself with them. I'm not completely relaxed, completely comfortable. I'm not just opening up uh, like I would with, with a, a friend. You probably might tend to suppress that uh, because everything else looks so good. But I'm telling you, pay attention to that <laughs> because that feeling that I I couldn't quite be myself or I was watching myself. That is telling you something about the nature of the interaction. And it's telling you that you are autom- you have automatically entered into what I call the emotionally immature relationship system in which the deal is that you help that other person maintain their self-esteem and you help them modulate their emotions uh, or regulate their emotions. And you have already agreed to do that for them if you have started to think twice about responding naturally as yourself. It's, it's, a, it's a real tip off. The other thing is that you get kind of scrambled thoughts. This is the second kind of subtle indicator because scrambled thoughts mean that you don't think as as clearly, concisely, purposefully as you normally do. You find yourself sort of getting fuzzy headed. You start to explain yourself, and then it's sort of like you lose steam and you get confused. Like what, what was I? What was I trying to say? <laughs> and what that means is that you feel that the other person is not really there in the interaction with you. And and we all tend to do that. We we sort of start to drop out when we don't feel the empathic connection with the other person because it feels off. But this is so subtle because it's so deep. It's such a deep human thing. So those two characteristics are, uh, I I think, big red flags. Another thing is if I was going to say that, that they often have a history of conflictual relationships So if they are telling you about their boss, their wife, their kid, whatever, listen to what they're saying, because if there's a lot of conflict there, don't take that as a compliment that they think you're great and these other people were awful. It really means that this is their worldview and that they tend to see themselves as a victim. Now, what roles that leaves for you if they're going to be the victim in their life, you get to be their aggressor or you get to be their rescuer. So sometimes it's going to come back around where you're going to be the one that they see as the villain, or you're going to be the one that they think has the responsibility of rescuing them. So, and the hook is you're the only one that understands. Nobody else has understood me before. I'm so injured. You get me, which pulls on our empathy and we are just right there. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. As I was hearing you talk, I was thinking, I think it would be a little challenging to parse out when you start dating someone, there's that, is it excitement or is it nerves? And because we tend to already be very self-reflective and we've got this little observing self to try and tease out, is that just the nervousness of the new relationship? But what I really love to do is to ask people to think of a relationship where they feel really solid in and like, how do they feel when they're in that relationship? And how does that compare to this new relationship that obviously it may take a couple of times seeing somebody new, but if you're that wired all the time or not really sure, and I was thinking about gaslighting when you were talking about that sense of fuzzy when somebody says, you're so sensitive, you didn't take a joke or they're late and you're afraid to tell them that, you know, you're hurt or frustrated or disappointed because they're late and then they come back at you, Mm -hmm. that those are all like, "Mm, no, thank you. Mm -mm." Yes, right. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for noting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What should be deal breakers in any close relationship? And how do you assess if you're in a relationship, if it's healthy or not? Because we are going to see these 
parts of wounding, there is no relationship that's going to be perfect. And what I can say is I've been married twice now, and it wasn't until I was with my husband. And I'm like, oh my gosh, a marriage is not this hard. It's not this much work. And there weren't ups and downs and ups and downs. I have to say that this marriage has felt easy in comparison to my first marriage. And I, I didn't, I'd never been married before. I never had a long-term relationship, but it was so tumultuous. There's a downside to all the relationship, self-help, communication books, marital therapy, so on and so forth, because it makes it sound like it's normal to work at your communication, to work at your relationship, to work at at explicit communication, being clear, not saying things that are going to offend the other person, and so on. It, it normalizes a tremendous amount of psychological, emotional work between people in a close relationship. I don't know how many times I have had clients come in and say, I know relationships take a lot of work, but, and I'm thinking, no, they don't. <laughs> or they shouldn't. <laughs> if you're doing a lot of work, uh, something's probably wrong. Because if you can't communicate your feelings, and of course, that's where conflict comes in. If you can't com communicate your feelings in a way that you can be yourself and still feel safe with the other person, and feel confident that most of the time, not every time, but most of the time, they're going to be trying to get you. They're going to be trying to understand where you're coming from. If you can't do that, then it is an uphill battle. There's a lot of talking going on or a lot of door slamming or however you know things are being communicated. But yes, absolutely. It should not be a lot of emotional work just to get along with somebody. There's got to be some goodwill and some good faith that each partner is operating within. And that, you know, that goodwill, that good faith, that is a sign of emotional maturity. Yeah, I just read something that one of the most positive predictors of relationships is if you have the assumption that your partner has good intentions for you, that that's just your primary assumption so that when bumps come up, you don't go to that place of wounding where you're out to get me, you're out to screw me, I can't trust you, which is someone who's wounded. Like I, I've, I've gone to both places but when we have that corrective experience, it's so important for us to make that mental note that this is different. You know, I, I'm feeling nervous. I'm going to say how I feel. And the person responds in a really reparative way, like, okay, that worked. I can do this. This is different. It's not the past. And I think it's challenging when we've got all that wounding and we don't know, can we show up and be authentic, but we have to test it out and then to make that mental note. Right. I also want to point out something that you were describing, because I, I think it's an important point, because you were describing having an emotional reaction and to, to, the, to the person, and yet retaining a positive memory of them as a person who, you know, for the most part, seems to want good for you and is a, is a good good person in the sense of being empathetic and not out to get you. So what you just described, Patricia, is what I'm talking about as a complexity in the personality. You can think and feel at the same time. You can have two feelings at the same time. I'm angry with him and I love him. It's not I'm angry with him and I think he's really a bad person. After all, I think I made a mistake here. He's, you know, <laughs> okay. You, you, your capacity to hold those conflicting feelings or those conflicting memories is crucial to the mature and healthy relationship because yeah. that's that complexity. And that's what makes that beautiful tapestry of being able to be furious with somebody or, or even feel betrayed by somebody. And yet you can't forget uh, how they were there for you or the way their eyes looked when you told them about something that was very important to you. If you can hold all that inside yourself, you're doing great. It's that, that is the kind of complexity that I think, you know, we all need to be working toward because it'll make, it'll make us better, but it'll also make our relationships better. Yeah. I heard Justine Frolker and I talk about her all the time. She talked about this back in, I don't know, episode 
three, four, five about both and. And it's been such a crucial concept for me that it's exactly what you said, that I can be both disappointed and hopeful Mm -hmm. that we can hold more than one feeling at a time or during right now with COVID, we can feel devastated and we can have gratitude that it's not an either or. And I, I, I just love how you are able to articulate that. Like I do stuff, but I not able to articulate it the way you do. So thank you for that. Why is it hard for folks to end a difficult relationship? You know, what I see with clients is, especially when there's so much of, you know, they're being told that they're too sensitive, they're the problem, their partner hasn't had this kind of problem with anybody else in their other relationships. And so, you know, we just think if we just loved them a little bit more and we have that power to heal them, what is it that makes it so hard to end a relationship when you know it's bumpy and rocky? Well, there's this thing called bonding, (laughs) (laughs) which is a real thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that it uh, is, you know, a huge percentage of why the human race is, uh, has taken over the planet like it has. It is so successful in terms of survival of uh, any species. Bonding is when you feel safe in the presence of someone, okay? It's uh, neurologically mediated uh, through the ventral vagal nerve, which is Stephen Porges's wonderful polyvagal theory. The point of that is that it is neurological. Um, we feel safe when we're around people that we perceive as primarily familiar. Uh, John Bowlby, who was a, an early researcher in infant attachment, realized that when children were tired, scared, sick, whatever, you know, whatever ne- negative state they were in, that they made a beeline for the most familiar person. Didn't have to be the nicest person. It didn't have to be the what person who treated them the best. It just had to be the person they were most familiar with. And I also want to mention that there has been some research that the more emotional stimulation that you have in a relationship, the tighter the bonding. So, for instance, if sometimes your parent treats you very well and then sometimes they treat you very badly, you have a lot of diverse emotional reactivity going on in that relationship, both positive and negative. Okay. Intensity is what I'm getting at. So if you have a lot of emotional intensity in a relationship with someone who's very familiar to you, that increases the bonding exponentially. And you don't even have to like them, but you will feel that connection Uh, that's very, very primitive, very tribal. Uh, I think it's essential uh, to our human heritage. I don't think we get to opt out of that. And in fact, it can be quite a process when people are deciding that they they can't stay with someone who um, has been abusive or you know can't respond to them as a as a mature partner is very hard for them to give up that bonding. It's really tough. And I I look at it as almost a physical thing. Um, It's not like you get to just decide and then do the strong thing and walk away. Uh, This calls for grieving, uh, mourning, you know, the same way that you gradually, gradually begin to release the attachments when you lose somebody. Yeah. And what I really want to emphasize that you said is that it's about the familiarity and the emotional intensity. And I think that makes it really challenging because you've got this connection and we think of that as meaning that it's significant and we've got this strong emotional connection, but it may be familiarity and it may be emotional intensity, which could happen in an abusive relationship, a neglectful relationship. So even though that connection is there, it doesn't necessarily mean that it serves us and it's nurturing our spirit. No, it, it certainly doesn't. That <clears throat> that can actually have very little, if anything, to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm looking at time and we're kind of running out of time. Is there anything else regarding relationships that we didn't touch on that's important for you to talk about? I would just mention that it, for those of you who are dating um, and doing online stuff, which could be pretty popular these days with the COVID crisis, that you can apply all these things to uh, how people respond online, what they write, how they respond to you. And I would encourage people to uh, have fun practicing recognizing some of these things that we've talked about today. Uh, you know, whether the person that has an interest in you asks about you, do they follow up um, with something that you have told them before? Do they seem to remember things about you and then reference them f- freely and spontaneously? Like, again, they're, they're mentalizing you. They're ho- kind of, they formed us a, a, a um, an image of you that they carry around inside. These are all things that are also very important that can be gotten from the online contacts as well. What are your thoughts about how quickly somebody responds if you're texting with someone or messaging with someone that you find on a dating site? Because I, I have um, a close friend who's dating and has some attachment wounds, and this person often feels like it's about their attachment wounds. And my reflection is, I'd feel annoyed if somebody took three days to get back to me or wasn't making a clear date. And I think that we often think that it's our wounding because we don't like how it feels. And it's like, no, that's just really poor communication. So how do you tease that out? Yeah, that's that's tough because, I mean, you can hear in this that the person's head has gotten involved. Uh, three days goes by, they're feeling uh, disappointed, confused, not not sure what to do next. Do they contact them? Do they wait? You know, it's not, it doesn't feel good. Okay. Uh, and sometimes that's where, where when it's hard to tell, it's important to be able to check in with a friend and, and report it to them and then have them give you a little feedback. I, I wouldn't, it's important to know what you're wounding. I don't know what happened, y'all. My internet totally dumped out. We lost our connection. It's dumped out. <laughs> yeah. What I was saying is if something makes you feel bad, pay attention to that. You can figure it out later if uh, that was due to your attachment wound. If you are reacting to something more strongly, maybe than somebody else might. You can always ask a friend, you can always run it by someone to, you know, get an outside point of reference on that. But do not throw out the feeling that didn't uh, set well with you. You've got to pay attention to your instincts, especially early in a relationship. When someone is texting, it's a it's a timing thing. And you are really responding at an emotional level when it has to do with frequency of contact, you know, like length of time in between contacts. So you've got to be able to feel if it doesn't feel right to you. Don't let your head get so involved that you start rationalizing and chalking it up to your wounding or your past history. And this is really okay behavior because if it, if it doesn't feel like the rhythm of what you're comfortable with, that's what you need to know anyway. Yeah. And some of us, I'm one of these people that I have a really high need for connection. And chances are, if you text me, I'm going to respond pretty quickly. And there are other people that have different, different pacing and in friendships that can really be a challenge. And so I love what you're saying about if that's a pace that works for you, I often use the analogy of tennis. I'm a tennis player but I have friends that are playing chess and like I hit the ball and I'm like, I'm waiting and waiting. And, you know, they're taking a couple of days to think about their next move. And that can be challenging when our needs for connection are different. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But it doesn't yeah. have to mean that, that you adjust yourself to a rhythm that you're not happy with either. Right. Right. Yeah. Lindsay, is there anything else that I didn't ask you about that we want to cover before we wrap up? I think we I think we have done a good job of covering the waterfront here. 
This has been a nice meaty episode. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, it, it's it's been a lot of fun to kind of go over all these things that go into healthy relationships because so many times when people come from emotionally immature family situations, it, it's hard for them to navigate it. They often feel like they're going to be trapped or commitment means that they're going to lose their individuality or kind of be taking care of somebody for the rest of their life. So it's it's often a fraught area for people who have emotionally immature parents. So I'm I'm delighted that we got to go over all of these things and and hopefully make it a little clear what what the pathways might be. Yeah, yeah. Are there any projects that you're working on or anything you want people to know about? And I'm going to put links in the show notes at unapologeticallysensitive.com. Just click on the podcast page and click on Dr. Lindsay Gibson's episode. Sure. Um, people can go to my website, which is uh, Dr. Lindsay Gibson. That's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y uh, Gibson uh, dot com. And there are a number of uh, writings and a blog on that website. So people can uh, take a look at that. Uh, I just have re-released the first book that I ever published, which was Who You Were Meant to Be about finding your true purpose in life. And uh, I will be working next on a book for training therapists to work with this population and uh, help them um, develop or, or help them learn techniques that, that I've developed that come from a number of different uh, theories about how they can help uh, to work with, with these people more effectively. Oh, great. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your wisdom and expertise. I'm really, really excited about this episode and so grateful for your generosity of your time. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I love talking with you. You're just such an easy person to talk to. And I'm so glad that we had a chance to, to bring this out for people. Oh, thanks. Have a great day. Thanks. All bye right. Bye. bye. Hey again. So wasn't there some really good stuff in there? I had decided I wasn't going to do extensive show notes, but because this was so juicy, I am going to do some great show notes for y'all because I think what we talked about was so, so dang important. One of the things I was going to ask Lindsay about, and then the call jumped out and I got a little discombobulated. There's a show on Netflix called Love on the Spectrum. And what I love about this show is all of the anxiety and the internal things that many of us experience, but we figured out how to mask so that you don't see it. When you watch this, the discomfort in social interactions is palpable. You can just see it. And a lot of the live people that are on it, they're not actors, talk about a little bit of what they're going on. And you can just see how that discomfort in a new situation plays out. I just think it's really, it's fascinating. And I don't know, just really enjoyed it. After listening to this episode, where are you at with your relationships? What are the take home? Are there things that you need to work on? What did you learn? My hope is that this was really helpful. And if you are looking for a relationship, this will give you some great guideposts. And if you're in a relationship, we can always change. So just curious to know how it landed with you. If you do struggle with relationships, you've got wounding. You know, I talk about the things that I struggle with. No relationship is perfect. You might consider taking the online HSP course or working with me individually. These courses have been transformational for people. And there are some episodes that you can listen to if you want to know what it's like with people that have taken the course and are on the other side of it. But again, you really get this experience of having a reparative relationship in a very small group in a safe setting where you can talk about some of the things that come up and you hear about some of the things that other people experience that roll around in our heads that we didn't know were a thing. I've just seen some amazing transformation happen. And we talk about things like boundaries and perfectionism, mindfulness, self-care, authenticity, vulnerability, changing the negative messages that we have and turning them into superpowers, creating a lifestyle that honors EHSP. It's really very, very powerful. If you're interested in getting information, you can go to unapologeticallysensitive.com. Go to the HSP groups page and there's all information there. I hope you are all doing well. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for.
It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. 